Um, well, welcome to Book by Book and uh, this new hybrid model that we've got going on here. And uh, Zoom has uh, been a great resource. And so we'll continue doing Zoom. We'll continue in person. Um, and all of this stuff that happened because of COVID is one of those things where it's just like, you know, God's plans, he's forcing us to try new things, uh, which I love. Um, and I also hate because I like my ruts and I like my comfort zone. Um, and so this is going to be a, a bit of a learning curve for, uh, for everybody. And so today, uh, over the last several months, we've been going through, started in Genesis, and we've made our way all the way through Judges. And so tonight, we're going to go all the way through the book of Ruth. And so Ruth is one of my, uh, one of those books that you just read and you're like, oh, that's really heartwarming. Um, it's just such a great love story. And it is. But as I was doing research for this, this is the first time I've really gone in depth on Ruth. Um, and so there's a lot of really uh, interesting things that are going on in this passage or in this book as well. And there's some question about where it should be placed in the, in the canon. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, it's actually at, included with some of the prophetic books. So it's after the, the historical books. And so in our English Bible, it is placed right after Judges. And, um, and so there's some question on like, as I was even preparing for this week, it's like, do we do Ruth later or just continue on with the narrative? And so I've, I've decided to go with the narrative because as book, the book of Judges or the book of Ruth starts, it says in the days when the judges ruled. And so I, I wanted to make sure that we just continue with the, with the, the chronology as best we can at this point, um, because it really does set us up for um, the, the history of the monarchy and establishing uh, the kingdom of Israel. And so uh, there are a lot of things that we can look at through this, this book, uh, things that we maybe um, some cultural issues that are going to be revealed as we walk through this uh, that we might not read just as 21st century American uh, students of the Bible. Um, and so we'll do, dig a little bit there. Um, but one of the most important things I think in this book is it is a book about God. Like it's easy to say, well, it's called Ruth, so it must be about Ruth. But it's really about God's um, coordination of events and lives to establish um, his plans on earth. And, and so Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, they're not like amazing people in the big scheme of the universe. Boaz is the, um, we're going to see he's like a knight, essentially, in the community, like a person of honor. But he, even Boaz, there's no king, there's no real strong leadership at this time. And so he is just one more seemingly insignificant person. But the significance of Boaz is his faithfulness and his generosity and his kindness. And so in Boaz, we have a kind of Christ um, and a type of Christ that we should pay attention to. And even uh, preachers like Spurgeon, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon from the, the 1900s, he called uh, Christ our Boaz, our Redeemer, who rescued us. And so those kinds of themes are going to be all over this book. So let's just jump in. And as uh, if you have questions, we can go through those questions and um, now that we have in-person folks, I, you know, if there's a, something that is unclear as I'm speaking, like it might, if it might be easy for me to see you, if you wave your hand, uh, too, to just be like, Hey, I, can you clarify something? So I'm going to try, uh, to, uh, go through this clearly. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right. So Ruth one, one in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The, the man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites. Ephrath Ephrath that one's a tough one. Ephrathites uh, from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And so 
this the the writer of Ruth gives us a a lot of background and a lot of context uh, early on. We see it was in the time when the judges ruled. Um, so that that's about a 350 year window that this could have happened. Um, and so as we look at the later parts of the book, it's going to be towards the end of the time when the judges ruled because Ruth is going to, spoiler alert, Ruth is going to be David's great grandmother. And so um, it's towards the end of the time of the judges. But as we looked at the end in the book of Judges, the this was a time of chaos and disunity among the people of Israel. All the tribes were kind of fending for themselves. And there were different seasons where um, disobedience led to discipline from the Lord. And so often in the book of Judges, that the disobedient, the discipline would come in the form of a foreign oppressor, another nation that would come and uh, take control of a section of the land of Canaan. And so here, this, we're not told specifically, but this famine, um, it could be a act of discipline from the Lord uh, for the larger group of Israelites going through a season of rebellion. And one of the interesting things as well is they leave the land. You know, like they're supposed to stay in the land that God promised them. They leave and go to Moab, which is to the east of the of the land of Canaan, uh, the, where the Israelites lived. Um, and Moab was, I mean, if you, we go back to Genesis, we see that Moab is a descendant from the the people of um, of Abraham's other children. Like it's, they're all kind of related, but they are not Israelites. And so, going to the other land is a sign of potentially lack of trust that God will care for them. And so they go. Um, and they, while there, uh, they, have, they have two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they both marry Moabite women. And the commands in the, in the law were to, that the people uh, should not marry Canaanite women. That was like, don't marry any of the people in the land. But there's a little gray area with the people outside of the land. And so because the um, Malon and Kilion are living outside of the land, there aren't going to be any Israelites for them to marry there. Um, and so they end up marrying these two Moabite women. Um, but they died. They died. Mahon, Kilion, Elimelech all died. And so we have these three women, three widows who are left to fend for themselves, which is not a great place to be in the ancient world. Um, there's a concept in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the quartet of the vulnerable, which is the, the, the orphan, the widow, the foreigner among you, and the poor. These are the quartet of the vulnerable. And it's, they're considered vulnerable because they are unable to um, take care of themselves the, if, without a husband or a, a brother or somebody who can go and do the physical labor necessary to uh, generate food and, and, and resources. And so um, they were, the people were called upon in the law to support these groups. Um, and so here we have three widows in a foreign, and Naomi is in a foreign land. Um, and so they're in a tough a tough place uh, for the, the people. Um, yeah. So the quartet of what again? Quartet of the vulnerable. Yeah. Who were they again? The, the, the orphan, the widow, the, the poor, and the foreigner among you. So the sojourner, the immigrant, um, the refugee, those four, uh, those four groups. So, yeah. Um, and that's something that um, it never is said in that phrase, like, the quartet of the vulnerable, but they're often listed together in the prophetic works um, when they talk about like caring for these people. And so scholars uh, have created that category, categorization of quartet of the vulnerable. So um, yeah, so here, this is a, a place where they're um, in a, a, you know, they're alone and they need help. And, um, and so what are they going to do? Well, verse six uh, we see a bit of a, a shift. 
because uh, verse six says, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me that you, than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So um, somehow word gets to, to Naomi that the famine has been lifted. There's food and in the, in the land of, of the Israelites. And it's, um, I think it's one of the ways that we can understand this is the Lord had come to the aid of the people is recognizing the Lord is, has visited his people is one of the ways it can be translated like he is with them again and so there if there was some kind of national repentance or uh changing of hearts um something happened where the lord came and brought lifted the famine and now they're able to have food in the land again and so she starts to make her way home back to uh her tribal lands in judah um and daughters are going and naomi says that they should go back and everything Naomi says is completely practical. And I, we, we can't fault her uh, in saying, like, go back to uh, your, your people um, because, like, they're young enough that they could remarry. They could have children. They could have a future. Naomi is realizing that she does not really have a future in, 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 in Judah. Even if she goes back, it's more that, she's just going back to what she knows she doesn't have a great she doesn't have great hope for the future at this point um and they you know i don't know about you but sometimes you get into a place where you're like no i'll do this and then you realize how hard it's going to be it's like i shouldn't do this you know and so ruth and uh orpah are both like we're in with you and then it gets a little more serious and naomi urges a little bit more and orpah is like you know you're right i am going to go back <laughs> And we should not fault Orpah for this either, because everybody's being incredibly practical. And she's not from, she's not from Judah. She is like, she is being asked to leave her home to go and uh, start over someplace else. Um, and even Naomi's like, I'm not going to have any more kids. And like, I got nothing for you. And that's when Orpah. Orpah's finally recognized, like, okay, I'm going to go back. Um, but Ruth is unusual here. This is not a normal thing to do. What, with the way she says, uh, where you go, I go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. Like, she is not just saying, I will go along with you. She is saying, I am your family. And there's also a declaration of faith here because the Moabites had their own gods, their own worship systems, but somewhere along the line, Naomi, um, Elimelech, Mahon, and Kilion, their influence 
in worshiping Yahweh has made its way into Ruth's heart as well. And so this is something that um, as we think about the trajectory of the Bible, like the people of Israel were always supposed to be a light to the nations. They were always supposed to influence people to follow after Yahweh as they trusted the Lord and lived according to his laws. And when you read the law, the, the Old Testament, they, they're not really good at that. Um, is a, just a sad summary is that they're not really good at actually doing the things that God called them to do. But here is one example where a family influenced somebody to get to the place where that she would say, your God will be my God. And even calling down a potential curse upon herself in the name of the Lord, which is a big deal. Because if you go all the way back to the Ten Commandments, do not use the, na- the name of the Lord in vain. Is not just saying like, the, like a curse word with God's name attached. It's also about vows. If you are going to take a vow and you're going to put name, God's name on the vow, then that is um, a serious thing. And so Ruth is stepping into a, a commitment. Um, and Naomi's like, all right, well, I can't convince you otherwise, so I'm just going to let you come along, and we'll see how things go. Um, and one of the important words here as well is, is Ruth clung to her, um, which is part of the, the cleaving of a family. And so when Ruth married Naomi's son, she didn't just cling to him. She, she clung to her mother-in-law as well. Like she was grafted in to the family. And, um, and so that's a part of like her sincerity here is um, like, she just very much loves Naomi and there will be nothing that can separate them. Um, and so in verse 19, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? But Naomi, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. So um, the people, I mean, Naomi's been gone for like 10 years. And part of being out of the land uh, for that long, even if the land isn't producing, Naomi's family had a chunk of land that was their inheritance. And so Naomi had someplace to go. Um, and so they, and they would have recognized her if, as she's coming back to her land, her, her uh, Limelech's land, essentially, coming back there. And, and they're like, hey, you're here. Someone's here. This is awesome. Are you Naomi? Are you just a squatter, basically? Um, and now she's like, no, uh, it's me. But. And she gives herself a name change. Um, what I find really interesting about this is the, as we walk through, the, the writer of Ruth never calls her that. <laughs> like, it's like, she wants to be called Mara, but it's not going to stick. Like, if you try to give yourself a nickname, like, that's a hard job uh, to do. Like, to say, like, no, call me Skip. It's like, no, no one's going to call you Skip. Um, and so... Uh, the, uh, she's trying to give herself a name, but nobody's going to call her that. They're all going to call her Naomi, um, all throughout the book, but she's carrying a bitterness. And I find it fascinating as well, that she ascribes this bitterness to the Lord's actions against her. And this is an assumption, uh, that, that, uh, Naomi is making because it doesn't say the Lord killed Elimelech and Malon and Kilion. They died, but Naomi has a, a strong view of the sovereignty of God, and she is recognizing that there's nothing that's outside of God's power. And so because he didn't save them, she's translating that over to, he did this to me. Just, just this evening, I, we were serving at neighborhood table out here, and there was a, a man who came by. His name is Jason. Um, and, and so he, he came and he ate. And he's a, um, he's unhoused. 
And so he comes by and he, uh, eats and then he leaves and he came back as we were cleaning up. And he's like, I got to tell you my story. And, and so he started sharing a little bit about all that he's been through. And one of the questions was like, I don't know why God would do this to me. And there's a, there's some really wonderful things in the timing of the Lord where you're just like, well, I don't think God did this to you. And like, as we're, I'm even thinking about Naomi calling herself Mara, like God didn't do that to you. And the, the sorrow and the heartbreak in the world, um, you know, we all go through pain. And as we read the scriptures, we see that God's not absent from our pain, but he's with us in our pain and he's orchestrating things uh, in our lives to uh, redeem and transform our pain. And even as we get to Jesus, the Lord endures pain for us. And so he's not a stranger to pain. And so when we throw these things at God and say, why did you do this to me? Uh, we have to be very careful to not get too far into giving God the blame for all the terrible things that happen. And as we read the book of, of Ruth, we see God's doing something good in this, um, in this, this whole journey of Naomi's family. There's a, one little note here as well that I want to highlight because last Sunday was Pentecost and Pentecost is the, the early harvest uh, festival where they would, uh, it would be in the spring when the first grains would start to sprout up and they would gather those and they would make an offering to the Lord saying, Lord, thank you for your provision this spring, knowing that there was another harvest coming later in the fall. And so Pentecost was this early harvest um, here, this, the events of, of Ruth are happening in that same window of time as the early harvest. Uh, they were arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Yeah, so like, like last Sunday. So I, I, I don't know. I can't jump too far into conclusions here. And as I was reading uh, in preparation this week, it just made me think, it's like, is there a Pentecost connection in the gathering of the nations? Because like, as, as, and I'm, I'm surprised that I haven't seen more Pentecostal scholars like lean into this because in the Pentecost in Acts two, the, the, the nations, the different Jewish people from the nations are in the, in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And they're speaking all these different languages and, and they hear the praises of God in their own language. And that's what draws them to hear Peter's sermon, to be a part of the, the early church. Um, and then as you continue on through with Cornelius's family, jumping to the Gentiles, like Pentecost is a significant thing in the new Testament. And it's, there's this interesting gathering and wedding of the nations happening in the story of Ruth with this Moabite woman. And it's also super important as we read through here, we get Ruth, the Moabite as her name. She's not just Ruth. She's Ruth, the Moabite, Ruth, the foreigner, Ruth, the other, like we, the writer does not want us to forget that she's not from here, but she's about to be welcomed in to the family uh, of, of Israel through Boaz and his uh, generosity towards her. So I just found that super interesting. Um, and I'm not ready to say definitely a Pentecost connection, but it's interesting. So, um, all right, let's jump to chapter two. Uh, verse one, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And so a man of standing, um, it could be uh, translated as a man of valor. Um, uh, some translations call it a mighty warrior um, named Boaz. And so that's why looking at this is like, it could be, he could be a wealthy person. He could be a elder of the community. He, he, he's like a knight. Like he's just an honorable person. All right. Um, and Ruth, the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go my daughter. So she went out, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. All right. Now, they're desperate. They don't have laborers for their own land. Um, and so Ruth is like, I need to find a way to support us. 
Um, and so I'll go glean. And gleaning is a part of uh, the commands in the law that the, um, the poor, the quartet of the vulnerable, would be allowed to come along behind the harvesters to pick up anything they don't harvest. Or, uh, but the law also said, don't go all the way to the edges of your property as you're harvesting. That's for the poor. And so Ruth, who's not an Israelite, and again, we're reminded here, Ruth the Moabite. So she's not probably fully aware of all of the gleaning commands and, and uh, regulations. She's just like, let me just go and, and see what I can find. And so she goes, and she doesn't know Boaz at all. And, but again, the Lord is orchestrating things in such a way where she ends up in Boaz's field um, at just the right time. And so, um, and Naomi blesses this plan and, and all is moving forward. Um, and so if you want to look up the, I did write these down. If you want to look up the laws about gleaning, um, and harvesting, uh, there's, uh, Leviticus 19, nine through 10 and Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. If you want to look those up, um, and uh, yeah, so this is just one more way that the people were encouraged to be generous, was to not take everything for themselves. Kevin. So I guess like one question I would have is the when she went back to was it Jerusalem, wherever she is, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. The land is still hers. The home is still hers. Then even after ten years yeah. or so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because and this is a major piece of what's going to happen in the Ruth uh, story is inheritance laws were very important. Okay. And so families were tied to the land. And so when they say the Lord is our inheritance, there's a whole lot more than just, we get stuff when somebody dies. It's like, no, the Lord is our promise. Like the land is our promise. Like God promised us this land. God promised us this tract. Like it's, it's ours and it's our families. And so this story really is about securing inheritance for uh, Elimelech's family um, is, is what, what we're working toward. Um, and so that's why it's all highlighting these things. Like he was from the clan of Elimelech. He's like, we need to know that Boaz is loosely related to them somehow, because that's all part of the securing the promise. So yeah, it's a super fun story. Uh, so verse four, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Um, and this is also like a note here. They have just gone through years of famine and now the harvest is happening. And so this is like a celebration as Boaz is coming in. And so he's greeting the harvesters and, and they're blessing him. They are, everybody is in a great mood. All right. And so he's there. And then I want us to imagine like every rom-com where, the guy sees the person across the room and in the trailer, uh, like a, a needle scratch happens, like, <laughs> all right. So like needle scratch, uh, Boaz asked the overseers of his heart, who does that young woman belong to? <laughs> That's the needle scratch moment in Ruth where he's like, what's this? Who's this? Um, and so he's trying to figure out what's, what's her deal. Um, the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Uh, she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from the morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So he's giving us background. She asked if she could help. I said, it's fine. And she's been working super hard. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. And so he's giving her great permission. Like it's not just wait until the work is done and gets what, what's left over. He's saying, hang out with the women who actually work for me. And you can have as much water as you want. You can get in the shade and rest when you need to. Um, you are on my team. Um, and so, and none of these guys here are going to mess with you because they know if they mess with you, they got to deal with Boaz. And so he is like telling her like, you are safe here. Don't go anywhere else. 
stay here. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. So let's pause here because as the way that Boaz is talking about Ruth, like he's heard of Naomi's situation, their relatives. She's heard that Naomi's daughter-in-law, this foreigner came with her and is clinging to her in a way that is supportive um, and like a blessing to Naomi. And because Ruth is such a blessing to Naomi, Boaz sees her not as just a foreigner, but as a honorable person, as somebody who knows how to love in actions and in that commitment. Um, and, and he says to her, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. Um, and go back to what Ruth said in the, may the Lord repay me language. If I abandon you, like she is saying, like, there's a curse that could happen to me if I ever leave you, Naomi. And here Boaz is saying, may the Lord repay you for your blessing. Sometimes we get uh, very focused on, I just don't want to do the wrong thing. And we, we lean into a curse mentality. And here we see Boaz is leaning into a blessing mentality. Like, may the Lord bless you because I see the good things that you are doing. Um, and so continues on at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvester, she offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. All right, so they come and uh, it's mealtime and Boaz is like, come sit with me. So he's like clearly interested in, in, in Ruth. Come sit with me. And he shares his own food with her and is, uh, yeah, just trying to be a blessing to her here. And then he goes beyond that and goes to all his foremen and saying, you know how you're supposed to let the, the poor glean among you and like take what's left over? Uh, I need you to let Ruth just go in and whatever you're doing, you're going to give her some of what you're putting together. Like take some stocks out of your sheaves and give them directly to her. So it's beyond gleaning. Boaz is being incredibly generous. Um, and there's a, a little bit as you're reading through there here that Ruth just doesn't really understand how generous he's being because like, this is not her culture. And when we, <laughs> When we recognize like we're in a different world and we're playing by different games, uh, different rules and the cultural norms and all that stuff, like it's easy to like uh, miss out on the subtlety of different things. Um, and so here, Ruth Boaz is not saying like, I would like to marry you. Like he's not that far at, in this relationship yet, but he is saying like, I want to take care of you. And Ruth, I don't think she truly understands all that's going on, um, but she gets an ephah of flour, which is, um, a significant amount. It's, uh, I wrote it down someplace. Um, sorry, I got a 22 liters. Oh, on your study Bible, you got it. Okay. Yeah. So 22 liters. So that's heavy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, it's a lot, a lot to carry. Um, and, but she's doing it. Um, and so, um, yeah, so she goes back to Naomi and gives her all of this food. And so all of the, 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 the 22 liters of grain that she processed there that evening before going home, 
And then on top of that, all of the roasted grain snack that Boaz had prepared for her. Like, and she had so much, she was full. And she's like, I brought some of this home for you as well. So you can eat something tonight. Um, and yeah, so it's in just an incredibly generous uh, day. And um, Naomi is shocked as we look at verse 19. Um, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? <laughs> where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law, about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. She said, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. And so she knows who Boaz is as a relative of Elimelech. And so when she says she has not, he has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead, he, that's a reference to Elimelech. And they, like he's kind to his whole family. He's, he remembers the dead he, and cares for their descendants. Like she's floored by how kind he is. Um, and then also says he's one of our guardian redeemers. Uh, uh, other translations would say kinsman redeemers. And this is a, a person in the, um, in the law who would take the responsibility of defending the, the family in different ways. And so sometimes the kinsman redeemer would be the one, like if there was a manslaughter case and the person uh, who um, accidentally killed somebody, um, they were to run to one of the cities of refuge. And if they were caught by the kinsman redeemer before they got to the city of refuge, the kinsman redeemer could execute the person who accidentally killed somebody. If they ever leave the city of refuge, the kinsman redeemer could be the avenger of blood in that situation, right? So that's one of their roles. But then also, they are there to um, help ensure the inheritance lines for descendant or for the deceased. And so one of the things that is established in the law is something called a leveret marriage. And so if a um, if a brother if a there's two brothers, one brother um, is married and does not have a child, the and he dies, the other brother then is supposed to marry his wife and produce a child that would then be this brother's heir, right? So different than our culture. Um, but it, that was one of the way, the reason they were doing that was to ensure inheritance lines. Um, and so when we were going through the law, we came across Zelephahad's daughters several times. Um, and there's like strong inheritance lines that are there, but none of Zelephahad's daughters, um, none of their, none of their husbands were able to help them conceive. And so who's going to get this inheritance for this whole family? And the law was like, okay, in this situation, they can be the heirs. And, and then it eventually it would get back to a male descendant somewhere along the way but you can't just take the land. And that's one of the reasons why Ruth still has the land is because she's Elimelech's wife. So it gets complicated, but um, yeah. So this role of the kinsman redeemer is uh, super important for, um, for, for us as we understand this book. And I'm looking at my time. I gotta, I gotta move here. Uh, <laughs> then, uh, Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all the grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. And so Naomi's like, someone else might try to take advantage of you physically. Uh, they might abuse you. They might rape you even. And so I was like, stay with Boaz and these women that he has there, they're there to protect you as well. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and a weed harvest were finished as she lived and she lived with her mother-in-law. And so they are, um, yeah, so this is a great plan. They're getting grain, they're getting their feet back, get, getting back on their feet. Uh, and in chapter three, one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi said to her, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. 
Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So part of the part of the way that that families were coordinated, there's arranged marriages in this time. And so uh, Naomi is recognizing, Ruth, you need to get married. And so she's saying, I need to find you a home that uh, will be a place where you can start a family is what she's really wanting to work towards. And so she devises this plan to uh, get her to connect with Boaz for, uh, because as we learned in the last section, he's a kinsman redeemer. So he could be a person to marry, uh, marry Ruth in a way that would also secure a Limelech's inheritance lines through, uh, through Ruth as a, so Elimelech's grandson would then get the inheritance. And so, um, so that's, the, they're done with some things um, upstairs. Um, so they're all heading that way. Um, so the plan then here is to go and like, you know, get all dolled up, Ruth, wash, put on perfume, get your best clothes and, um, and then go to uh, the, the celebration at the end of the harvest essentially is what this is. And so at the celebration, there would be, feasting and there would be merrymaking and there would be drinking and uh just celebration of god's uh provision here and so note what naomi says go to where he's laying and uncover his feet and lie down there is a lot of conversation about what that means um is it just to uncover his feet and literally lie down there um because the there is there are other times where uh the Feet is a euphemism for, uh, for genitalia. Just that's like the other extreme here of what that means. Like go like just uncover all a little bit more than his feet uh, is the other translation. And so what's happening here, we don't super know what Naomi means by this. So I just wanted to throw that out there that there's a wide range of things happening. Um, what we uh, also see is like Naomi saying, go and do this. And Boaz will tell you what to do. And Ruth says, I'll do whatever you say. And so she goes and prepares to do this. So, uh, verse seven, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached. Now, why would they, they would lay at the grain piles? Um, because they needed to, like, it's dark now as they did all this work. And so somebody would need to sleep there to protect the grain. And so that's why he's not like in a house or in a tent. He's actually protecting the work that he has done. Um, and so uh, years ago when I was a youth pastor, we had a firework stand. And, and one of the things you had to do was like sleep at the firework stand. So people didn't steal your fireworks. It sucked. It was awful. <laughs> um, and so that's what, as I was reading this, like, I know Bo has a situation. This is not a fun part of the job. Um, and so, uh, so Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. <laughs> Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. And so uh, Boaz goes and, goes and lays down. Ruth sneaks up and uncovers his feet and just lays there. And so the folks who uh, lean into like this is a a, a sexual act that uh, Ruth is perpetrating here, um, it kind of loses strength of the argument when it's like Boaz sleeps for a long time. So it, like what probably disturbed him in the night was his feet literally got cold, and as he was shuffling around, like he probably kicked Ruth and was like, "What's happening? Who's here?" Um, and so then. Uh, Ruth, though, you know, uncovers his feet, but then call instead of having Boaz tell her what to do, the way Naomi said, Boaz will tell you what to do. Ruth goes ahead and says, tells exactly what she wants from Boaz, which I think is super interesting because she's like, she says, spread your garment over me. And one of the ways that we can understand that phrasing of garment is uh, when in the, in the, um, 
the Psalms and the prophets, it says, the Lord will spread his wings over you. And that's the same language as garment. And, and so it is literally cover me with your garment, with your uh, protection. Like you are our only hope. You're our guardian redeemer. Um, and so she goes, she just says right away, like, this is what I need from you, uh, which is a very forward thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a, you know, Ruth isn't wasting time. Um, and Boaz replies, the Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. And so Boaz is uh, not a young man, as we see here. He's like, he's noting out that Ruth is young and she could have pursued younger men, but she is saying like, no, Boaz, I want you. And, and so he sees this as a tremendous kindness to him. Um, and the, the word about Ruth has built her reputation and, and she's a noble person. And, but because Boaz is also a noble person, there are things that he needs to make sure are, are handled properly. And so he is a relative of Elimelech, but there's one who is closer, more closely related, who has first claim. And so that's what he's saying here. Like, I need to clear things up with this other guy before I can be, uh, before I can do the, the job of the kinsman redeemer. And so she laid there until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor because that could be scandalous. Even if nothing scandalous happened here, uh, you know, the appearance of scandal would not be great. He also said, uh, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, she poured, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? You were out all night. What happened? Uh, then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So Boaz is, is wise because he, you know, he's like, I'm going to make sure we get everything scored away properly, but also I want to have a good relationship with my potential mother-in-law. So he's like, here, let me send you some food home so that uh, Naomi knows, like, I'm, I'm on your team. I want to help you. Um, and I, I want you to be uh, cared for. And so, so all these things are happening. And, um, and, and Boaz, so Ruth goes back and then Boaz is going to go to town. And in verse uh, one of chapter four, it says, meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Now, the town gate is a place that it was where like business was conducted. And as people are coming and going, uh, the elders of the town would sit there uh, and converse and make decisions for the community. Um, and, and so Boaz knew that this man that is a more close relative would come to this place. And so he's going to just wait for him there. Um, and so uh, one of the interesting things here as well is like, come over here, my friend. Um, we never know this other redeemer's name. And it's kind of like, come over here, so-and-so, or what's his face is kind of the way it is uh, written. Like there's a protection of this person, uh, which I find is great because sometimes you get it, I don't know if you've ever been in a business relationship with somebody and um, like, it didn't go great. You can go on and like yell at them, uh, uh, give them terrible reviews on Yelp or whatever, or they can just say, you know, that wasn't the best situation, but I'm not going to harm. I'm not going to try to harm you. 
And here the, the writer of, of Ruth is not trying to throw some shade on this other redeemer. Um, he's just like, so-and-so, this other guy, what's his face? Um, come and sit down. And so Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. So 10 is an interesting number because as we later will, um, in later in Jewish history, we'll see that 10 men is the minimum number required for a synagogue. And, um, and so it's like a, a, a quorum that is a, a enough to be representative of the community. And so he wants to have a representative of the community number here. Uh, then he said to this guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not tell me, so I will know, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. And the man said, I will redeem it. Now, why would this man want to redeem this land? Well, if it's just land, it's an opportunity to increase his wealth because he would be coming into um, attractive land that is available. And so, yeah, man, this is great. I'll do whatever I, I have to, to redeem this land. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. And so why this quick flip-flop is because he is seeing a track of land that is available and could make him wealthy. But if he is also has to marry somebody else, like he's already married, most likely, and like he has his inheritance line going, but if he has to marry somebody else and then create an heir there, all of the work and effort that he's putting in to maintain this land is going to go that way. And so he's recognizing like, oh, this is actually a risk for me now. It was presented to him first, like, oh, that sounds great. And then the, the details, the fine print is like, oh, no, that's not so great. Boaz is kind of a, a very shrewd negotiator here because he's like, there's a lot of good stuff here, but I need you to know that this good stuff also has some strings attached. Um, and it's, uh, it's important that you know all of this. And so he says, I cannot redeem it. Uh, you, you do it. Um, and now verse seven says, and this is the writer giving us a, a uh, con contextual note here, which I think is interesting because so much of reading the Bible is like trying to find contextual notes from, from our culture to the, their culture. And, and here the writer is saying, like giving us a tradition that is already passed out of, out of uh, practice in his time compared to when Ruth's time was. And so this has been an ongoing journey of people trying to explain the Bible is what I'm saying in verse seven. Now in earlier times in Israel for the redemption and the transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel, which now you got to go to a notary. You got to like sign all the papers here. It's just like, here's a sandal. Um, and why a sandal? And there's different theories on this, but one of the, one of the reasons why it would be a sandal is uh, because tracts of land were, uh, measured out foot by foot. And so this is the tool. The sandal is the tool that's used to measure the land that you are transacting. And so that's one of the reasons why a sandal might be the, um, the sign here. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy yourself and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Though the offspring the Lord gives you by this young man, through the offspring this young, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young man, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So, um, so they are, uh, yeah. So the the transaction is happening. Naomi, uh, Ruth, 
all these names. Boaz is saying, y'all are witnesses. And now I'm married. <laughs> like I'm married to her now. She is my wife. Um, and, and like, it's all official. And the elders then turn around and bless their wedding, their, their marriage, their union. And the, the examples that they give are interesting because Rachel and Leah um, are the two wives of Jacob. Um, and Jacob uh, was, you know, the, his family is, you know, the tribes of Israel, all the sons are named tribes of Israel, but there was great tension here in the family. And so it's not like they were the perfect family, but still like you built up a nation here through these, these people. But then the next generation, uh, Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And if you remember the, the story of, of Tamar, Judah had three sons and the first one married uh, Tamar and he died. The second one uh, did not want to uh, have a son with Tamar because that son would then be his older brother's heir. And so he, um, the Bible says, spilled his seed. So he, did, he was refusing to impregnate uh, Tamar. And then he died. And there's one more son, but he's really young. And uh, Judah says, well, I, I won't, uh, you can't marry him yet. He's too young. And wait and wait and wait. And Tamar finally gets tired of waiting. And so she eventually um, tricks Judah into uh, impregnating her, um, creating this, the heir for, uh, for Tamar's first husband. It's a crazy story. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Genesis is a mess. Um, as we read through, it's like, uh, there are some bizarre things happening in that book. Um, but here they're saying like all of those different schemes and machinations that were happening, like through all of that, God still provided an heir. And uh, like, that's part of the blessing that they're giving here is like God has orchestrated events beyond what you could control in your own strength, in your own power, in your own will. But here, God is doing something. And so may this be blessed. So let's jump to 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Now remember Perez, may your son be like Perez who Tamar bore to Judah. Your, uh, Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. Now, um, this is a beautiful conclusion to this story because Naomi who wanted to be called bitter is now rejoicing. The women are rejoicing with her. Look at what God has done for you before she was saying, look at what God did to me. And now it's saying, look at what God has done for you. Um, and so she's rejoicing and she takes uh, Obed and she cares for him and Truthfully, like Ruth probably raised her, but she's essentially Obed's legal son. Or, or not, she's Obed's mother, like legally in, in Old Testament law, um, just because of like the inheritance law. You know, like she's going to care for him like her own son is what it's getting at. Naomi is going to care for Obed like, like her own son, because he's next in line for the inheritance of the land. Um, and so Ruth is going most likely going to raise her, raise him, right? Because like she's young and she can. Um, and, but this is a, just a beautiful family dynamic. And then we get the note here, like 
you know, Obed was um, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And, and so why are, why are we getting this information here? Is because in the very next book, First Samuel, we're going to be told about David. We're not going to start with David, but we're going to start getting the picture of David's life um, for uh, the context that that's going to be happening. And so some of these events, um, all, I mean, the old events of Ruth are so setting up the stage for David's life. Now, this genealogy of David is not complete. Um, they're whoever is writing this is skipping a lot of generations because um, Perez was the father of Hezron. All right, great. That was um, 400 years before the Exodus. And there are not enough generations here to get to David. <laughs> and so um, the, the person who's writing this is trying to just say like, give us like the broad strokes of the family genealogy. And so if you tried to go back and try to match this, and into the genealogies in the um, in chronicles, like it's not going to work super well um, because they're not as concerned with um, with the fine, accurate details as we are in our 21st century culture. And so they're just the writer here is just trying to help us see how we got from here to here. We don't need every step along the way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So that y'all is. The book of Ruth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you Renee. saying the uh, land of Elimelech, Elimelech yes. is eventually the land of Jesse where David tends the flock? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Jerusalem? No. No. Jerusalem is, at this time, Jerusalem is being occupied, not occupied, um, because the uh, the Jebusites live in Jerusalem and they never were driven out during the time of the judges. And so it's not until David drives out the Jebusites that Jerusalem becomes the capital of Israel. Um, yeah. So it's a Bethlehem is David's hometown. And so, yeah, so that land that Boaz redeemed is the land that David would have grown up on. Yeah. So all of like, all of these, uh, all of these stories are are rooted in the land. They're rooted in uh, in in actual places that uh, the people reading these stories would have known. They could have gone to. They could have walked to. Um, and um, yeah. And so when we try to put ourselves in those places, like even just conceptually, it helps to like keep the stories more than stories. Like these are real people. Who did real things and in this book like you know we don't see god doing miraculous big things but he has these normal people that he's like i'm gonna i'm gonna get you where i need you to get to which is just so beautiful because we we like look at the big stuff in the world and we're like god help us with these big things and god's like well i've got a lot of things i'm doing and i i'm, I'm not going to forget about the little things. I'm not going to forget about you. I'm not going to forget about Ruth. I'm, I'm with you even there. And so, yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful story. Um, and it's more than just Ruth came and said, I'm going to help Naomi. And then they got some land. It's like, no, God is, God is doing something wonderful in this story. So, yeah. So any other, any other questions and, and folks on zoom, my friends, any questions over there as well? I would love to chat more if there's more to to say all right it's fun you guys can't see them but they're turning all their cameras back on and it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so now you don't need to do that part <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely a different vibe at northwest we uh had a hybrid model um that uh uh, cause I adjunct there and during COVID they had students at home on zoom and like on a TV right there. And the professor would sometimes be in the classroom, but I did a guest lecture for a professor who was also at home and there were students in the classroom, students on zoom. And I was like, Dr. Shred, who do I talk to? 
And he's like, just talk to me. I was like, okay. <laughs> so it's a different, uh, different world we're living in, but uh, yeah, they did not teach me this stuff in Bible school. <laughs> so uh, any, any questions, uh, Zoom, Zoom folks? No? All right, any other questions in the room here? No. Yeah. It's amazing. It always baffles me that things are better, like placement in society or this woman in marriage. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I love you so much. Like, oh, I got to exist, this, and this, and boom, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what Carrie is, is noting the, the placement in society, the um, care for people, like, there's a lot of rules and laws and regulations, and all of this book is like, giving us how this actually plays out. Um, but it is still like God's plan. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. And if we don't know the law, we miss a lot of this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. God knows the ending from the beginning. And that's something that so, sometimes we get so stuck in the details of the mess of our lives that we can't see how to move it forward. Um, yeah. And I, I wonder how many times Ruth was like picking up grain and like, is anything ever going to happen in this? Like this harvest is such hard work. And, and then finally at the end of the harvest, Naomi's like, all right, let's do this. Um, but all the while Boaz, an honorable man, take, took, took time to attend to Ruth as well. The Moabite which I think we, we do not want to lose sight of the fact that the writer consistently says Ruth, the Moabite, Ruth, the foreigner, like her standing in Israel is she's foreign, but through her declaration of faith that your God will be my God. She's brought into the family of Israel uh, spiritually, which there was, a, there's a way to do that in the law, but then also through marriage, she is now, grafted in um, to God's great redemption plan. And so Ruth is a great, 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 whatever of Jesus as well. So this almost kind of parallels Caesar. I mean it gives you an idea of Jesus that he takes the foreigner in and brings them into the fold under his under his wing, just like Boaz. Right. Under his wing. Yeah. Yeah, so Jesus and Boaz have a lot of similarities for sure. So, yeah. That Ruth was kind of a tough one, and Jesus had to endure a lot of, you know, to get some of the tenacity. Yeah, it's a family trait. <laughs> yeah, the tenacity is definitely passed down. And you can see it in our own families as well. Um, my wife has a strong will, my daughter. Also very strong world. <laughs> so it goes generation to generation. So, yeah. But all right, we all well. Uh, yeah, next week, if you're able to be in person, you're more than welcome to come. I'll still set up Zoom uh, as well. Um, but yeah, next week, start. we'll start in on 1 Samuel. Um, and uh, we'll learn about Eli and the mess of his family. And it's going to be a super fun time. So, all right. So I'll see you all later. And I will, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you later, y'all. <laughs>